This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to House Resolution 8, today the committee will meet virtually. Um, I just want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this remote hearing. First, uh, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are also responsible for their own microphones. That's an important one to remember. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you're speaking. That's a big part of that responsibility. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. So good morning and welcome to today's hearing. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for joining us and bringing your expertise for our discussion today. Um, we are here today to continue our discussion about the National Science Foundation and what is needed to propel the agency and the U.S. research enterprise into the future and carrying out its mission to support research across all science and engineering disciplines and advance innovation in STEM education. NSF has delivered enormous benefits to society over the past 70 years. Even during the long stretches of flat funding, NSF continued to experiment with its processes and diversify its portfolio of investments to maximize impact. Over the past decade, NSF's budget has hovered around $8 billion. In that time, NSF launched ambitious new initiatives, including i -Corps. NSF includes the 10 Big Ideas and the Convergence Accelerators, all while remaining focused and committed to its core research mission and equity and inclusion for all. NSF has more than demonstrated its capacity to not only survive, but to continue to strive in an austere budget environment. Just imagine what could be achieved if we let this agency and the thousands of researchers and its students it supports out of the box that has penned them for a long time. As a proud co-sponsor of the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, um, I am excited about the opportunity to think big for change. This bill is a comprehensive authorization that proposes doubling the agency's budget in five years. The bill pushes NSF to address longstanding challenges in scaling up effective K-12 through K through STEM education innovations, educating workforce-ready STEM graduates, and training the next generation of researchers and innovators. This bill is also uh, uh, introduced alongside Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and Ranking Member Mike Waltz. A major focus of this legislation is also accountability to the public. New requirements in the bill would address threats to research security and ensure researchers are thinking through the societal impacts of their work. Finally, there is the issue of expanding NSF's mission. While the NSF has supported use inspired and translational research for decades, it has not been a strategic priority. The NSF for the Future Act establishes a directorate for science and engineering solutions to empower the agency to take risks, forge new partnerships, and pursue research-driven solutions to a wide range of societal problems and applications that are needed for our innovation en engine and activities throughout the United States of America. It's also a two-way street with researchers advancing solutions for the benefit of communities and those collaborations inspiring researchers to ask questions and try approaches they may have never otherwise considered. Curiosity abounds. While I am enthusiastic about the need for the NSF to take on these new challenges, we must take our time to get this right. We are certainly off to a great start with a bill that has been developed over a year of extensive vetting with a wide range of stakeholders, policy experts, and thought leaders. Uh, this is 
part of the uh, series that we are having in this committee. It's the committee's telling me it's the third hearing. It's the second one I've chaired. I know our other subcommittees are digging in as well that we've held on this topic. And you can also see from the members who comprise this hearing, the dedication and the want and desire to make sure that we get this right. And that is part of what we're gonna be hearing from our phenomenal experts and witnesses here today. Um, the last month, the committee has also met to discuss opportunities for reimagining the U.S. innovation ecosystem as a whole. It's obviously not all done through the NSF and this exclusive agency. It is an interagency effort as we think through the bounty of our innovation ecosystem. Last week, the sub subcommittee heard from the NSF director and National Science Board Chair. Today, we are hearing from stakeholders those on the front lines who know intimately what the challenges are and what is needed to overcome them. We are experiencing a rare moment, an exciting moment of bipartisan enthusiasm for correcting course and significantly increasing federal support for US research and development, particularly at the National Science Foundation. Many point to the dramatic increase in Chinese R&D investments as a strategic imperative. I, for one, am focused on solving problems here at home and investing and supporting American research and innovation that has continued to lead us through the 21st century. So whatever the motivation. We must seize this opportunity to set NSF on a sustainable path to achieving its full potential to advance research, drive innovation that will spawn new industries, secure our national defense and economic leadership, and improve the lives of the American people. I certainly look forward to today's discussion. And with that, the chair now recognizes the dedicated ranking member from the state of Florida, Mr. Mike Waltz for an opening statement. Hey, thank you, Chairwoman Stevens. And Ed, thank you for holding uh, today's hearing, second legislative hearing the subcommittee is having on NSF for the future. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm excited about this hearing. I think it'll provide an important opportunity to hear from a variety of stakeholders on how Congress can best leverage and expand the mission of the NSF. Uh, and ensure we maintain our edge against the, the rising global competition that we've all discussed. Uh, it's always worth uh, remembering that in its 71-year history, the NSF has played a vital role in advancing basic scientific knowledge across the spectrum of disciplines. From engineering to biology has become the gold standard for basic research around the world. And in that time, in that, in that seven decades, the NSF has funded 236 Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the NSF's also played a critical role in supporting America's colleges and universities, accounting for approximately 25%, a fourth of all federally funded basic research. America's universities have long been regarded as the best in the world. And I think that uh, that designation is largely due to the support of the National Science Foundation. I'm grateful today uh, that we will be hearing from a number of these institutions. I'm especially pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Butler, uh, president of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, which calls the great sixth district of Florida home. Uh, Embry-Riddle leads the world in training premier aviation and aerospace talent. Uh, many of you that fly back and forth to DC, you are probably being flown by an Embry-Riddle grad. Uh, and uh, through you know, I, I'm especially proud of their partnership with the state of Florida, uh, that they engage thousands of high school students by providing pre-college STEM education programming focused on aerospace applications. So as the members uh, of this committee know, actively engaging students pre-K very early on uh, through 12 in STEM and connecting it to their community truly plays a critical role in sparking students' interest in STEM. We have to spark those students before they divert. Uh, we also have uh, in, in North Central Florida, a Burns Science and Technology STEM Elementary Schools. Uh, every time I visit this school, I feel a little dumber as, uh, as we have elementary school students uh, designing robots, participating in CAD, additive manufacturing, 3D manufacturing. It's really incredible. 
Uh, and I think we all know that the sooner that we grab these and spark these students' interest, the more likely they are to support STEM majors in college. Uh, so we're lucky to have institutions like Embry-Riddle and Burns who are working in their communities to train our next generation of STEM experts. Uh, look, uh, the bottom line is an investment in research in STEM education is an investment in our future and in our national security. Uh, that's just one of the reasons why the NSF for the Future Act is so important. It increases funding for fundamental research and improves STEM ed education, uh, and it uh, increases research training. So as we invest in STEM uh, with proven track in, in education programs with proven track records like Embry-Riddle's, uh, NSF must also be able to scale up in a sustainable way. And I emphasize the word sustainable. Uh, and as Chair Stevens mentioned, uh, the NSF for the Future Act also creates a new directorate, accelerating solutions uh, to many of our nations and the world's major challenges. So while making these investments, we must focus on protecting taxpayer-funded research uh, and technologies from our adversaries, like the Chinese Communist Party especially. I look forward to strengthening safeguards throughout this process uh, to improve best practices and prevent research theft. Uh, and we are hearing repeatedly that it, there is at least a thousand percent increase in referral from the FBI uh, on this research theft. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how they're addressing the challenges of research security, uh, how we can build on previous uh, successes to safeguard America's intellectual property, uh, and confront our adversary, especially the CCP's wholesale theft. We cannot make these major investments just to see it flow out the back door uh, to our adversaries. So while the, while the Chinese are leapfrogging the United States technologically, we are at an inflection point. It's critical for the U.S. to scale up our enterprise. Uh, there is momentum, as Chair Stevens uh, mentioned, on both sides of the aisle to make these investments, but it must be done in a realistic and sustainable way. Uh, so while investing in NSF and basic research, American technology, American innovations, and the American workforce uh, will continue to lead the world. I look forward to working with the chairwoman uh, and ranking member uh, Lucas, uh, both chairwomen and ranking member Lucas, to move the NSF for the Future Act through the committee in a bipartisan process. And let's get it to the House floor uh, for consideration. I, I truly thank our witnesses for their time to join us share their expertise. I look forward to your testimony and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. And with that, the chair now recognizes our fearless leader, a legend in her own right, the chairwoman of the full committee, Chairwoman Johnson for an opening statement. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Um, I am so grateful to Chairwoman Stevens and ranking member Walsh for holding this second hearing on the NSF for the Future Act. And thank you to our esteemed witnesses for joining us this morning. Our U.S. universities continue to lead the world in cutting edge fundamental research. While universities rely on several sources of funding for research, the largest single source is the federal government, including the National Science Foundation. NSF grants allow researchers to pursue their own best ideas across all fields of science and engineering without regard to anyone else's short-term practical goals. Such fundamental research continues to be the foundation of our entire innovation enterprise. At the same time, I recognize that such research is not sufficient to achieve NSF's broader mission to advance science toward solutions to our nation's challenges. That long-standing broad mission for NSF was written into its 1950 founding document by this very committee. Indeed, NSF has long supported both youth-inspired research and efforts to translate the research into practice. NSF premiered the Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, program in the 1970s. Nearly 10 years ago, NSF launched the Innovation Core program to educate a new generation of scientists, 
entrepreneurs. But those efforts have largely been around the edges and not on a large scale. We are at an inflection point for US research and innovation leadership. The international leadership that we long took for granted is rapidly slipping through our fingers. In this new global context, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee is looking to reauthorize the National Science Foundation for the future, not just relying on what we've done in the past. There's much to discuss in, NS in the NSF for Future Act, from the creation of a new directorate to STEM education and broadening participation at all levels, to increased accountability and security in our research enterprise. One particular aspect of our legislation that I want to highlight is public engagement and research. The stakes are high for many areas of science and technology, just not in terms of economic competitiveness and national security, but in terms of the benefits and the risks to individuals, to communities, and to workers to maximize the benefits and minimize potential harm of technologies such as artificial intelligence and synthetic biology. We must engage non-traditional stakeholders and diverse voices in NSF research, including civic organizations, labor, local and tribal governments, farmers, and even the public at large. And public engagement should not just be for technology. It matters for climate change, water quality, social inequity, and other challenges for which technology is only part of the solution. As we identify the types of problems we're trying to solve, as we scope our research agendas, and as we pull together research partnerships, we must think more broadly about who needs to have a seat at the table. Engagement beyond the usual suspects will also spark new lines of inquiry and attract a more diverse group of researchers themselves. These are central goals of the NSF for the Future Act. I again want to thank our expert witnesses for taking time to appear before the committee this morning and share your insights for recommendations. I look forward to the discussion and I yield back. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. And the chair now recognizes uh, our fearless ranking or fearless ranking member of the committee, Mr. Lucas, for an opening statement. <laughs> Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens and ranking member Waltz for holding today's hearing on the future of the National Science Foundation. And thank you to our witnesses for being here. The input of experts like you in this process is essential as we determine the future of the American research enterprise. We're at a critical point in our nation's history. The world is facing new technological revolution. Advances in artificial intelligence, quantum technology, biotechnology, space exploration are quickly creating the industries and jobs of the future. The United States led the way in technology development for the last century, but our continued global leadership is not assured. I believe that the nation that leads in science and technology will shape the world order for the next century. I'd like that nation to be ours. I'd like for emerging technologies to be developed with our values of transparency and fairness. The question we face is how we grow our nation's research enterprise to meet those challenges. I would argue there's a right way and a wrong way to invest in American competitiveness. The Chinese Communist Party has been working to steal literally, figuratively, the U.S. playbook for innovation for years. We don't need to steal theirs. China has been dumping billions of dollars into applied R&D, but has not yet achieved the breakthrough innovations and commercial applications you would expect from all that investment. Simply put, they're demonstrating that centralized, top-down technological spending does not work. That's why last year I introduced the Securing American Leadership in Science and Technology Act, or SALSTA. SALSTA doubles down on what has proven to work over the last 40 years in making U.S. the global leader in innovation. And it sets us up for success through the national S&T strategy 
and improve technology transfer from federal labs to the commercial sector. Each player in federal R&D, from the basic research funded by NSF to DOD and NEST work with industry, has an important role in advancing innovation. SALSTA recognizes the strength of the U.S. innovation ecosystem and doesn't break it apart by creating something shiny and new like other proposals being considered in the Senate. For the last year, the committee has worked on a bipartisan basis to look at how we can grow and evolve NSF into meet the national and societal challenges of the 21st century. After many discussions with stakeholders and experts, I was proud to join Chairwoman Johnson, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Walsh in introducing the NSF for the Future Act. Our bill doubles basic research funding at the NSF over the next five years and preserves what makes NSF great, while enhancing NSF's role in moving research from lab to market. Our bill takes a comprehensive approach to reauthorizing NSF, including building a domestic STEM workforce and investing in research infrastructure. The bill also creates a new directorate of NSF that will be focused on science and engineering solutions. The new directorate aims to make the fundamental research funded by NSF and help apply those discoveries to solving national challenges from cybersecurity to climate change. The new proposed directive does not duplicate or seek to replace the missions of other research agencies, but instead accelerates the development of NSF funded research for private sector development and commercialization. As I've said before, we have a unique window of opportunity before us. There is broad bipartisan agreement that we need to prioritize research and investment in American research. I believe and I say this with the most sincerity, that if House and Senate leadership, both sides of the building, both sides of the chambers, gives the committees of jurisdiction the opportunity, we can seize this momentum and pass meaningful legislation that will meet the moment. Some have called this a new Sputnik moment. As we consider legislation, we must consider the leg lessons of the space race. That period saw tremendous growth in science and technology and created a generation of scientists and engineers. But when the Cold War was over, research funding stagnated. We must avoid creating a situation of feast and famine for our research enterprise. Whatever shape our final legislation takes when the package comes together, it should be comprehensive, strategic, and sustainable. I look forward to working with my colleagues through this process to ensure that we achieve those goals. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for their input today, and I look forward to your testimony. And you're back, Madam Chair. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Uh, our first witness is Dr. Roger Wakimoto. Dr. Wakimoto is currently the Vice Chancellor for Research and Creative Activities at the University of California, Los Angeles, otherwise known as UCLA, a position that he has held since 2017. Dr. Wakimoto previously served as the Director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, Earth Observing Laboratory from 2005 to 2010, and subsequently as the Director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research from 2010 to 2013. Dr. Wakimoto also served as the Assistant Director of NSF's Directorate for Geosciences uh, for about five years, where he led a division that supported the atmosphere of geospace, polar earth, and ocean sciences with a $1.3 billion annual budget. Our next witness is Ms. Gabriella Cruz Thompson. Ms. Thompson is currently the Director of University Research and Collaboration at Intel Corporation's research arm, Intel Labs. In this role, she and her team identify and fund critical large and medium scale research at leading universities worldwide. She also currently serves as a member of the Advisory Committee to the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate at the National National Science Foundation. Ms. Thompson previously served as the Chief of Staff at Intel Labs and as a Technical Assistant to Intel's Chief Technology Officer. Our third witness is Dr. Mohammed Farouk. Dr. Farouk is the Associate Director of the Consortium for Science 
Policy and Outcomes, CSPO, and a clinical associate professor in the School for the Future of Innovation and in Society at Arizona State University. In this role, he co-leads the consortium's long-term efforts to build a community of practice among innovative R&D program managers in the government, non-government, and private sectors. His expertise focuses on innovation systems, research management, knowledge co-production, policy entrepreneurship, and participatory technology assessment. Our next witness, our final witness, is Dr. Gerald Blasey. Dr. Oh, no, sorry, not our final witness, but our second to final witness. Dr. Blasey is currently uh, the Vice President for Research and Innovation Partnerships at Northern Illinois University, a position that he has held since 2015. Prior to his position at NIU, Dr. Blasey served as the Assistant Director for Physical Sciences in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President from 2011 to 2014. Dr. Blasey has also served as a Program Manager at the Department of Energy and participated in the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory Collider Program, where he served as a co-spokesperson of the D0 Collaboration. I'd love to hear more about that, Dr. Blasey. Um, our final witness is Dr. P. Barry Butler. Dr. Butler is currently the sixth president of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, a position he has held since 2017. During his time as president, Dr. Butler has encouraged collaboration with industry and is expanding the university's interest in aviation, cybersecurity, aviation data analytics, and autonomous vehicles. Prior to his position at Embry-Riddle, Dr. Butler was executive vice president and provost of the University of Iowa, where he was also dean of the College of Engineering for 10 years. So we are we will now uh, move into five minutes of written testimony from this incredible group of witnesses. I, we will start with Dr. Wakimoto, and then I will move on to the, our next witness. With that, Dr. Wakimoto. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. I'm Roger Wakimoto. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Creative Activities at UCLA. Uh, UCLA has been named the number one public university for several years running and ranks among the world's top research university. Select successfully competing for significant federal research funding, including from the National Science Foundation. The support helps UCLA advance knowledge, build technical expertise, drive innovation, create new businesses, and train tomorrow's workforce, thus contributing to our nation's ability to solve pressing societal challenge and remaining globally competitive. It is really an honor and a pleasure to join you today to discuss the NSF for the Future Act and possibilities for how major research institutions can make headway in addressing challenges related to diversity and inclusion in research and partnerships with smaller research institutions to advance knowledge. I thank the committee for considering these issues and for inviting me here as a witness today. As Congress has been contemplating a new authorization for NSF over the past couple of years, I too have been contemplating what a bright future for the foundation would look like. To begin with, such legislation should abide by the Hippocratic Oaths dictum to, quote, first do no harm, unquote. NSF support of curiosity-driven research across a wide variety of fields is a mainstay of U.S. scientific strength that must remain the primary mission of the agency and its guiding light. That does not mean, however, that NSF cannot take on new responsibilities consistent with its primary mission to strengthen our nation. Given the longstanding importance of basic research for the U.S. scientific enterprise, I appreciate that the NSF for the Future Act aims to maintain the core mission of the foundation while also creating a new director to support use inspired research and translation and to drive and propel technological innovation in our country. I'm a believer that research in the public interest, research that can demonstrate a societal purpose is a worthy pursuit and is an appropriate use of public funds. The solutions directorate would take on many issues which NSF already addresses, but with an even more interdisciplinary and goal oriented approach Ideally, the new director would be a cross-cutting entity in order to maximize its success. I appreciate that the NSF for the Future Act proposes that the head of the new solutions director be someone of the same stature as the leaders of NSF's other directorates. 
I also appreciate that the bill authorizes the transfer of funds from the new directorate to NSF's traditional programs, but not the other way around. These steps help ensure an appropriate balance between basic and applied research. The NSF for the Future Bill aims to poise the foundation to deliberately tackle some significant societal concerns, and I applaud that. These challenges include climate change and environmental sustainability, which are topics close to my own, own scientific background and research expertise. I believe that climate change is one of the greatest technological challenges facing our world, and I strongly support a focus on this matter in the legislation. Another important and persistent challenge the bill seeks to address is the need to increase diversity of those involved in research. It is especially critical to encourage and develop a diverse pipeline of scientists and researchers. The bill provides some helpful incentives, but I believe it could do even more. Codification of the INCLUDES program, the pilot to foster partnership with emerging research institutions, and other provisions in the NSF for the Future Act to broaden participation are welcome steps. Additionally, the bill could explicitly include MSIs and HBCUs among the emerging research institutions and include best practices learned from NSF supported centers such as STCs and ERCs, which partner with local universities and industries. UCLA supports additional criteria be adopted for multi-institutional awards with annual reporting. Given large societal challenges that need to be addressed at a national level, it is critical that we support graduate students and postdoctoral researchers in our institutions and provide them with professional development opportunities. Supporting training grants is a promising mechanism for this purpose, as the NSF for the Future Act indicates. Developing innovative approaches for training and career development for our early career researchers, including the necessary administrative supplements, would also help. In conclusion, thank you for proposing a solid, bipartisan NSF authorization bill and for eliciting input to help further strengthen the legislation. I really look forward to the Q&A and discussion. Thank you. And with that, um, Ms. Cruz Thompson. Good morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me. It is a great honor to testify today about Intel's partnership with NSF and to comment on the NSF for Future Act. I am the Director of University Research Collaborations at Intel Labs. This is a division of Intel Corporation dedicated purely to research. Intel is the world's largest manufacturer of semiconductors or chips and the only American manufacturer of state-of-the-art semiconductors. Intel is investing $27 billion in R&D between 2019 and 2021, but the most of it is conducted here in the US. We also recently announced new investments totaling $24 billion to construct chip manufacturing facilities or fabs in Arizona and New Mexico. The semiconductor products that Intel manufactures provides the foundation for transformational technologies and innovations, including artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, 5G, quantum computing, and many others. Intel researchers actively collaborate with academic teams and government agencies, including NSF, NIST, DOE, and DARPA to advance technology and design for our products and our chip manufacturing processes. We partner with federal agencies and academia because we, they open the doors to unparalleled scale and diversity of curiosity-driven research. Intel's partnership with NSF extend, extend back many decades as co-founder of the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which is the world's leading nonprofit microelectronics research consortia. In recent years, Intel's relationship with NSF has expanded into a bilateral collaborations and granting uh, a number of programs ranging from machine learning for wireless networking to find the foundational microarchitecture. We also join new programs involving multiple institutions, such as the Convergence Accelerator, and recently announced RINGS, the Resilient and Intelligent Next G Communication Initiative, which was announced just last week. Intel is donating over $40 million towards these programs for a total value of over $150 million when combined with funding from NSF and other members. We also provide in-kind contributions to students and faculty that are 
awarded by this NSF programs. We provide access to the latest industrial technologies to manufacture chips, and we also provide access to the latest products and research prototypes available on the cloud. These public-private partnerships have yielded important commercialization of research results, and we look forward to strengthening them. I commend the committee for its leadership in crafting bipartisan legislation to advocate for the future of US innovation, and I am delighted to offer support for the efforts to strengthen the NSF, particularly and first, the creation of the new Directorate for Science and Engineering Solutions would focus on societal challenges like global competitiveness of critical technologies. It will also provide us with the opportunity to interact with a broader community of scientists and industry representatives so that we can address the wider ranging research questions and improve research outcomes. Second, the sustainable increase in overall funding for the foundation in the bill would enable NSF to support the highly competitive and competitive proposals that today go unfunded and would increase the impact to STEM teaching and student programs, as well as broadening the uh, workforce needs today and for the future. Third, I believe the bill could further enable partnerships with private industry by expanding industry eligibility to participate in consortia alongside academic researchers. This collaboration would ultimately accelerate technology transfers and open up innovation ecosystems. Fourth, the bill could also prioritize long-term funding for major research equipment and facility constructions focused on semiconductor manufacturing which is in alignment with the recently recognized uh, Chips for America Act. And fifth, finally, I would further suggest that the bill defines NSF's role in the National Semiconductor Technology Center required under the Chips for America Act. Intel greatly appreciates the bipartisan support for the law, and we look forward to congressional appropriations to implement it. I welcome the opportunity to answer your questions, and I thank you for holding this important stakeholder hearing to advance U.S. innovation. Thank you, Ms. Cruz Thompson. And with that, Dr. Mohamed uh, Farouk. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, members of the committee. It's a privilege to testify today. I come before you to express my personal views about the challenges and opportunities before our nation and the role of the National Science Foundation in meeting them. First, I find the NSF for Future Act a bold step in the right direction that meets our current technological, economic, social, and political moment. Across its history, NSF funded research that addresses societal needs, many of which continue to create beneficial impacts and outcomes. The bill provides these portfolios the same support and infrastructure that it provides to research oriented towards scientific and market outcomes. The bill's provisions are additive and not substitutive and are informed by the most pressing societal challenges from climate change to social economic inequity that require a different and dedicated infrastructure. The crisis we face today mirror ones we faced in the 70s and 80s after two oil shocks, the end of prolonged foreign conflict, distrust of government, and continuing loss of leadership in industries critical to our economy and national security. Our response was strategic and sustained. The U.S. increased funding for basic research in NSF and DOD, set up NSF Engineering Research Center, passed by Dole, created Semitech, the Critical Technologies Institute, advanced technology program, and developed technology and industry roadmaps. Collectively, these measures marked a shift in science policy, one that prioritized science for science's sake to use inspired science. They underwrote productivity gains and helped the U.S. recapture leadership in key industries. What this response did not do was change the fundamental distribution of labor among our public R&D institutions, which continue to enjoy robust capacity for orchestrating a similar and effective strategic response. Despite this economic success, the U.S. innovation system still lacks the capacity to address stubborn societal challenges. With a few substitutions, the question that economist Nelson asked over 50 years ago can still be posed today. Why is it that a country that recently landed a fifth rover on Mars developed three effective vaccines for a runaway global pandemic in record time and more generally has led the world in R&D funding for 70 years, seems unable to avert the untimely death of a half a million of its citizens, unable to provide equity, justice, and basic standards of living 
or its citizens living in poverty and facing discrimination, unable to keep the air and water clean our, and our neighborhoods safe, and struggling to protect our democracy from falling victim to misinformation and manipulation. If we are to address these kind of challenges, first we need to start with the most pressing problems, not the most interesting research questions. Second, we need a broad-based capacity for considering the societal impacts of R&D across the system. And third, we need new evaluation criteria because attributes required to maximize our scientific market and societal values are not the same. It may appear daunting, but NSF can build on its sponsorship of socially relevant research, education, and outreach, like research supported at my own institution. What is required is an infrastructure that allows for scaling and sharing of actionable and socially relevant research. This can only come from a directorate exclusively organized around addressing our most pressing problems. But on what challenges should be focused our attention? Science can inform solutions, but it is up to society to choose and act. Increased funding and strategic management will ensure competitive leverage of our R&D assets. A solutions director must still determine priorities. This brings me to my last point, the role of the public in our innovation system. Myself and my colleagues across universities, museums, civic organizations, citizens and community science platforms, science advisory bodies, and even some industries have been grappling with this question for the last decade. How can we make decision-making about science more democratic and reflective of the nation's shared values? Here too, NSF has supported many public engagement activities that are bearing fruit and hearing that informs these, and research that informs these activities. The task ahead then should be to take a holistic approach to integrate public engagement research, education, and decision making. To close, the NSF for Future Act has the potential to accelerate societal benefit through R&D as a part of a well-coordinated national strategy. Through the Solutions <laughs> Directorate, it also has the potential to help organize our R&D efforts in solving society's most pressing and emergent challenges. What remains an open question is who will help shape our these pressing problems are solved, experts acting alone or experts engaging with the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, with that, we'll move to Dr. Blasey. Okay. Good morning, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Walt, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jerry Blasey, Vice President for Research and Innovation Partnerships at Northern Illinois University. I'm honored to discuss the importance of the NSF and the NSF for the Future Act to institutions like NIU. NIU is located just west of Chicago. The 17,000 student campus serves both urban and rural students and is very diverse. Collectively, students from underserved populations are about three quarters of the student body, including a majority 53% students of color, 43% Pell Grant recipients, and 52% first generation college. We are very mindful of our mission to provide life-changing education to a diverse student body and do so by offering programs in more than 100 areas while integrating research and scholarship into their experience. And I use a Carnegie classified doctoral university with high research activity, averaging about $34 million per year in externally funded programs, of which 13 million supports a robust and efficient research enterprise. In fact, the 2020 report titled The Innovation Impact of U.S. Universities ranked NIU third nationally for innovation impact productivity. The NIU research vision is to prepare Northern Illinois for a century of change. Our newest initiative, the Center for Community Sustainability, part of the Illinois Innovation Network, addresses a pressing issue of our time, sustainability and rapidly changing physical, technological and demographic environments. Institutions like NIU can do research on very important societal issues. And NSF is consistently one of our top sponsors with every director contributing. NSF helps address the resource challenges institutions with smaller research footprints faced by providing external funding to initiate and maintain programs and infrastructure for those programs. Unfortunately, the impact of emerging research institutions like NIU is blunted by a longstanding impediment, which contributes to the missing millions described in the Vision 2030 report by the National Science Board. The figure you should see before you is from the American Physical Society's report, Building America's STEM Workforce. And it starkly illustrates an inequity. 
As written at the top of the figure, in 2018, nearly 640 institutions received federal research funding for science and engineering. The orange color represents the top 22% of research institutions as ranked by funding. And the long orange arc in the upper left image shows that the top institutions received 90% of that funding. In the lower left image, the shorter arc, orange arc, shows the same institutions serve only one third of the underrepresented minority college students served by these institutions. So said in another way, two thirds of our nation's students of color at research institutions see only one tenth of federally funded research opportunities. And geographic distribution is also uneven with 96% of the top 22 institutions in urban or, urban or suburban areas. Now the National Academies observes that participation in research is extremely effective for retention and graduation of students and diversification of the STEM fields. The longstanding inequity in research opportunity limits the ability of emerging research institutions to diversify the STEM workforce. Programs increasing diversity at the top research institutions, although very worthy, are not enough to reach the missing millions because the majority of underrepresented students are at institutions like NIU. By promoting partnerships, the NSF for the Future Act offers a remedy for what I call the missing millions in the middle. These partnerships direct at least 25% of any consortium award over $1 million to emerging research institutions, which maintains the excellence of the large research institutions while building research capacity and broadening opportunity on the campus where the students are. I'll conclude with a few comments on the act. I agree new structures are essential to prepare the US for the next 70, 70 years at the endless frontier and the Directorate for Science and Engineering Solutions will support the translational research necessary to address societal issues and to compete with directed economies. Care must be taken to ensure both demographic and geographic opportunity are broadened. For example, institutions with large research footprints already have a deep portfolio from which to draw translational research. And and as, as stated earlier, we have to get it right and we can do no harm and must protect investment in curiosity-driven research. And otherwise, otherwise, we risk the development of future technologies for, from which we innovate. I commend the committee for your work on this forward-looking legislation and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Blasey. And with that, our final witness, uh, Dr. Butler. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, Chairwoman Johnson, and Ranking Member Lucas, and the rest of the committee members. Thank you for this opportunity to address how the NSF for the Futures Act can help America be more technologically competitive and more specifically benefit from the talents and resources of highly specialized institutions such as mine. After almost four decades in higher education, I'm a firm believer that universities that align their mission with the industries they serve are valuable pipelines to a globally competitive, more diverse workforce a continuing source of innovation and research, and partners with industries who share a responsibility for security. With additional support from NSF, universities can more effectively support our nation's technological superiority and prepare a future workforce capable of competing for generations to come. I'll focus on opportunities for NSF through the lens of four questions. Number one, how can we work together to one, develop a workforce that maintains our nation's competitive edge in key technologies. Number two, diversify the workforce to attract the best and brightest from populations traditionally underrepresented in those areas. Number three, optimize a return on research investment. And number four, protect intellectual property. Building a globally competitive workforce in technologically focused industries starts years before those individuals enroll at our universities. It starts with an early introduction to STEM, specifically lessons and experiences that spark creativity and inspire young minds to want to learn more. And more importantly, lessons and experiences that are available to all Americans, regardless of their zip code. Our nation's many STEM focused universities, both public and private, already deliver a significant amount of these enrichment opportunities often with the support from NSF and other government agencies, but also private industry and foundations. For example, with funding from the state of Florida, Embry-Riddle 
supports Americans' global leadership in the aerospace sector by delivering pre-college science, technology, and math education focused on aerospace applications. This program annually touches approximately 7,000 Florida high school students who, upon graduation from high school, pursue college STEM majors at a statistically higher rate than their classmates. With aerospace being a key sector of the Florida economy, this is the type of program that fills that talent pipeline. Similar to many STEM universities, we also host summer programs and online programs geared specifically at K-12 students. They master and apply STEM skills ranging from robotics to coding to additive manufacturing and much more. Additional NF support could help schools launch or expand real world or very hands-on outreach experiences to spark science and math-based skills early. It will also permit the agency to identify successful programs with proven track records and expand them nationally. We at Embry-Riddle work on a daily basis with our nation's aerospace industry and can attest to the industry's extraordinary effort to build a more diverse workforce. They show it with their words, actions, and investments. Many collaborate with us through industry-sponsored scholarships, mentorships, internship programs, and career acceleration programs. We target recruiting to underrepresented groups and first-generation college students. Once these students are on campus, we support their success by involving them in career development and research programs. Data shows that students involved in undergraduate research opportunities have a much higher retention rate. And as part of our commitment to diversity, we use our resources and apply to federally available programs to contribute to involvement of underrepresented groups. The key point I wanna make is that expanded undergraduate research through NSF is a very low cost investment in retention and hence filling the pipeline. This experience in our classrooms and labs and through internships pays off by inspiring the next generation of graduate students and tech entrepreneurs. So smaller schools would welcome funding and opportunities relevant to their career areas of specialization. But how can working with a smaller specialized institution rival the buying power of working with a brand name powerhouse comprehensive university? You can think of this as another dimension of diversity. Economically, there's inherent value in building capacity in small to medium universities throughout the country and capitalizing on the progress they're making and tackling the research priorities identified by industries. These initiatives tend to be highly focused, problem solving for outcomes that are specific and quantifiable. Unlike comprehensive research units, they're active in many different areas of research. It is not uncommon for smaller institutions to have a very qualified areas of research in critical areas. Let me give a practical example to finish. Numerous investigators at large comprehensive universities focus on the challenges of cybersecurity as it applies to protecting the transmission of endless amounts of sensitive information. At Embry-Riddle, we focus specifically on cybersecurity to aircraft, spacecraft, and autonomous vehicles. This is a challenge that you might describe as basic computational science. However, it applies to all of us in society as we travel. By partnering with the University of Florida, we're combining the talents of our respective institutions and creating a center of excellence in aerospace resiliency. With new funding sources, we have the potential to apply lessons to other critical areas. With that, I'll finish since my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. No, we're glad to get you over the finish line uh, there, Dr. Butler. And at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to begin our first round of questions. The chair is going to recognize herself for five minutes, and then we'll pass the buck over to the other side. Um, look, I, I want to start with... Uh, Jerry Blazy and in your your testimony, which was um, all the testimonies were really great, and, and I deeply appreciate um, your uh, mentioning of the NSB report on the missing millions, and citing from your testimony, you had said two thirds of our nation's students of a co color attending STEM research active institutions see only about ten percent of federal research dollars on their campus. And, you know, the slide that you shared as well, I think was particularly alarming. I, I've actually, believe it or not, Jerry, I've had the privilege of working with NIU. I, I'm from Michigan. I represent, you know, some incredible research assets here in southeastern Michigan, including Oakland University. But I was involved a long time ago with an NSF application that we 
a grant that we were trying to get in partnership with, with NIU for, for STEM research and diversity um, that, that we didn't get. And that was a long time ago, but it, you know, knowing your university and, and also talking about, you know, the, the role that the NSF plays, can we just talk, can you give me some more thoughts, particularly from your perch on exactly where the NSF dollars are useful because and, and maybe if you're at all able to just talk to us a little bit about the basic research you know the original curiosity light bulb idea tinkering around in the lab and then these phases to application if at all because a lot of times and for those of us who are funding you know we feel the ferocity around and the energy around, hey, obviously we like basic research and, you know, you take a biology class or chemistry and you can see all that. But, you know, we want the innovations. We want the dominance and, you know, what goes to market. And, and I think we tend to rush those things. I mean, even with TRL, you know, and technology readiness levels and things along those lines. But can you, if, if you're able to, and I know I'm not asking a super direct question, but I just want to get this defined, and I asked this of our National Science Foundation director uh, last week, uh, Dr. Panchanathan, define, if you can, define for us basic research, and then, you know, what percentage or how that leads to the application? For me, uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Congresswoman Stevens, and uh, interesting to hear that you've collaborated with NIU. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that's a great question. To me, uh, basic research is really curiosity-driven research, um, where you're just trying to understand new principles or new phenomena without really a specific application. But they always lead to, to uh, um, they almost always lead to important uh, innovation and applications. And a great example that you heard at the last testimony from the the chair of the board was uh, studying microbes in the Yellowstone thermal pools led to the test for coronavirus. Another great example is studying bees and their behavior led to the bee algorithm that uh, is used in modern computing. Uh, so you, you have to be sure you have that basic curiosity driven research because it inevitably leads to the innovation that we depend on decades later, uh, sometimes quicker. Um, What's most important for the students to feel like they're participating in science or discovery, because that's what really jazzes them when they when they were involved in, in creating new, new knowledge. And, and the best way to do that is to ensure that there are cutting edge programs in as many locations as you can. Um, for instance, we're standing up AI efforts all over the country. It's really interesting to students. There's still a lot of basic research involved and providing those opportunities at the locations the students live um, will really get them involved and, and make a difference in their lives and, and in our innovation innovation ecosystem. I, yeah, I hope that, that- I know we got about 30 seconds left and it was Jerry, it was Lori Clark who I worked with and Norm Peterson who's over at Argonne. So that, okay. I know you know those guys. Uh, but but can I just bring in Gabriella to, to this? Because what side does Intel then end up grabbing on to any sort of basic research endeavor that's taking place at the universe? Because you're a major, and thanks for talking about the IoT and Industry 4.0 because leadership has been phenomenal. And you know, we're really grateful for you too. Thank you very much for your question. We we have about a thousand people at Intel that are dedicated fundamental researchers. And those are the researchers that are day-to-day -day working with academics alongside those students that get the light bulb ideas. And then we try to test with them and uh, explore with them the possibilities of how it can be applied into our manufacturing process technology or our new features in our new products. Um, it's an effort of thousands of students, th uh, thousands of researchers at Intel. And then the great ideas, the good results get turned into the development product teams. And it might take six months to implement it in a product, or it might take a few years to implement it in a manufacturing process. So 
some ideas might be cutting edge and need a lot of time. Some ideas are relatively easy and fast to implement, and not only at Intel, but also in the ecosystem and other companies. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That was, and I know we get, we get a bunch of talented members here, and we're going to go to Mr. Waltz for five minutes of questions now. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Chairwoman. Hey, Dr. Butler, uh, can you spend a moment talking about how Embry-Riddle works with the industry? Uh, and particularly how they work with industry partners to ensure students are trained in the in the skills that are actually needed. I'd, I'd really like to hear about uh, your role in mentorships, internship programs, career acceleration programs uh, that really keep students focused. So if you could talk to that, uh, and then if you could also give any recommendations on how NSF can encourage institutions like yours uh, to establish these undergraduate research opportunities with industry. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it really starts with listening. And uh, given the discipline that we're in, uh, you know, principally aerospace technology, it's it's very fast changing, just like the others on the on the uh, Zoom today with whether it's uh, computing or whatever. But um, so you have to listen to industry. I mean, that's where it starts. So we have, um, like a lot of universities, we require effectively all departments to have an industry advisory board. And um, this means that uh, they have members from industry who regularly interact with the leadership in the, uh, the units, the departments. And, uh, and that eventually gets uh, um, filtered sort of and translated then into how do you uh, make changes at the academic level, curricular changes, maybe some experiential learning opportunities, things like that. And so that's kind of that feedback loop that you constantly have. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example. We, um, at the university level, uh, we have a, a meeting twice a year with leadership, academic leadership, and uh, leadership from, uh, from Boeing, for example. They're a major, obviously a major um, U.S. Um, business in, in, our, in our area. We, we'll spend an entire day just talking about what's new on our horizon and what's new on their horizon. And then how do you sort of make those things connect? How do you, how do you work on the curriculum? How do you do other things like that? So that's a, that's a, uh, that's a big one. And, and, and so for, for us, you know, the, the career oriented um, sort of STEM type, you know, majors, they have a lot of stickiness. I think I use that term on, you know, is with, with young people, they, they see it, they kind of can connect the, the calculus they're learning with the outcomes that will eventually be perhaps aircraft design or something like that. And so we try to kind of keep those connections going as well. And then um, industries, um, you know, the aerospace industry, you know, provides incredible numbers of uh, internships and those, those have to start early on. But that research back on campus while they're there and while they're sitting in those classes and learning all the chemistry and physics and math, having some real world uh, research that they can be involved in is so valuable because they can walk out of their out of their chemistry class and go into their research lab and figure out, hey, that's connecting the dots there. And I think that's I think that's incredibly valuable for um, for any of those that are there. So, I mean, literally those connections between are very valuable. Dr. Butler, what just, I only have a few minutes remaining, but what recommendation do you have? How can NSF be more helpful? And how can they encourage to establish these, these connections with industry? Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, being able to, you know, I, I see three pieces to sort of very successful, um, uh, very successful sort of partnerships, let's just say. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's industry, because that's where, the, that's where, that's the end of the line. That's the real world applications. That's where things have to continually evolve. It's academia, as we've heard. That's where ideas are coming out. That's where students are, are really thinking about their futures. And then it's government. And, and that's the, where the NSF and other types of agencies fit in there. And so being able to identify, I believe, this is my personal view, Areas where the three of those can work closely together is incredibly valuable to the country. It's it it, it's, it, it sort of complements the other yeah. things we've heard about today. Right, and, and we've had conversations too about the NSF Cyber Corps um, scholarship, I believe, and and how we can take a, a different view of that. Is that? Yeah, I think I, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, th I think programs like that, you know, it's just keeping an eye on what's out there in the world and sort of, you know, sometimes, sometimes um, not being aware that 
that uh, very basic research does touch a lot of different industries. And as I mentioned earlier, for example, the aerospace industry, something like that, that's critical to the future of, of um, a an, an, an leading right. industry in this country. And just in the few seconds I have remaining, if, if, if you uh, and, and Mr. Uh, Wakimoto, if you would be so kind, uh, uh, if you could just submit something very short in writing, but what would the value of training be uh, for a lot of your researchers, you know, we have the benefit of getting a lot of briefings and even seeing intelligence on how uh, the Chinese in particular, but a number of our adversaries are taking basic research and then applying it to their militaries directly. I just want to, you know, we get that here, but not everybody gets that appreciation out in the universities in the academic uh, research ecosystem. And if we were able to, to authorize and appropriate more training out for your, uh, for your folks, whether that would be helpful. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, I yield. Great, thank you, that was, that was excellent. Um, with that, we're gonna turn over to um, Mr. Paul Tonko from um, the, the Great State of New York for five minutes of questioning. Thank you there, Madam Chair. And, um, I appreciate the opportunity to continue the subcommittee's discussion on the future of the National Science Foundation and how we can best support the foundation's role in helping advance innovative solutions to some of our most pressing challenges. Um, the Chips for America Act, which became law in last year's National Defense Authorization Act, increases federal support for semiconductor manufacturing through new federal incentives to conduct advanced research and development of semiconductor technology, secure supply chains, and strengthen national and economic security by reducing our reliance on foreign semiconductor manufacturing. Um, I'll point out that New York's 20th congressional district uh, is home to a strong research and innovation ecosystem ready to help propel the next wave of microelectronics research, development, and manufacturing. And I'm thrilled that many are eyeing Albany, New York, as a potential location for the National Semiconductor Technology Center that was authorized as part of the CHIPS Act. Uh, Ms. Thompson, in your testimony, you call on us to help clarify the role of NSF in relation to the NSTC. Recognizing that the NSTC was authorized to advance R&D on industry-defined needs and challenges for semiconductors, how specifically would you want NSF to partner with NSTC? Is there a direct relationship that you think we can better define? We, we hope there is a direct relationship because we believe the NSTC is going to serve it as a test bed, as a place where students, faculty, and industry, we will get together there and we will tinker together. We will work in the pressing challenges and innovations needed to move forward the semiconductor industry. So yes, we believe that NSF and the grants that NSF provides to faculty, to students are going to be the basis and the human capital that will be part of of, of the people that will be at the NSTC. And, and we encourage and, and would like to see rotations, rotations of professors into the NSTC, rotations of students, as well as rotation of industry people in that NSTC as a convener of all people, all the community. Thank you. And is there any kind of authorizing language that you can imagine would be the most empowering that would assist in that, in that effort? I, I think calling out uh, the role of NST, uh, NSF is very important and we can definitely provide some language. Um, we can follow up with your office and provide some language suggesting uh, for the bill. Thank you. And how else can this committee uh, help bolster NSF's role in microelectronics research? Well, uh, a very interesting and good program that NSF has is the Convergence Accelerator. We have one team member, one person at Intel that is part of a Convergence Accelerator uh, cohort going on right now. Uh, we believe that that Convergence Accelerator could be the vehicle to convene industry and academics together and fund them. That Convergence Accelerator provides about $5 million for the phase two 
projects, we believe in semiconductors, the funding necessary might be larger than $5 million to really get at very impactful projects between academics and industry. Thank you. And, you know, I'm excited about the opportunity to help enable NSF to continue to evolve by establishing a new directorate. As is often the case in a major push for progress, the younger generation will play a critical role. So graduate students and postdoctoral researchers, including many New York's cap in New York's capital region, are on the cutting edge of cross-sector collaboration and solutions-driven research. I believe the success of this new directorate will depend greatly on the contributions of enterprising early career research uh, researchers. Dr. Blasey, in your testimony, you propose a reformulation or expansion of the graduate research fellowship program to ensure students receive cross-disciplinary training. Um, can you give us more info, background on that thinking? Uh, sure, uh, thank you for the question. Well, um, all the way back to my days at OSTP, it was very clear that we were educating mostly academics for in the universities and that the students, about half of them were going into industry and the students were rather ill-prepared for basic things like project management, um, rigorous safety training, uh, things like hazard awareness uh, analysis, team building. And it, it strikes me that this will become even more important when we have a directorate for a science and engineering solutions where the intention is for them to move into industry, help commercialize, uh, build solutions to uh, some of our societal problems. And so I think it's even more important that we give them what some call the softer skills, but the ability to work in those in the, in the non-academic environments. So I think what NSF needs to do, and I'm sure they're considering this, is they have to reformulate what traineeship, traineeships look like um, with this new directorate. Great, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Great, great questions. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to, oh, and also, I wanted to remind my friend, Mr. Tonko, where I sit here today in Livonia, Michigan is around the corner from Infineon, a great chips manufacturer. So Michigan also has something to do on the semiconductors, okay? You know, I know, I, I know that, you know. <laughs> myself, we're doing chips here too. So uh, but with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Lucas for five minutes of questions. Thanks all. Uh. As always, Chairwoman Stevens, you are enthusiastic, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Dr. Wakimoto, as we know, China is making substantial investments in their R&D, and it's expected to pass the U.S. soon in total R&D spending. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I believe we need to focus on what makes the U.S. research system work, I'm not trying to copy another country's playbook. What do you think has made the U.S. Uh, ecosystem when it comes to scientific research successful and should be protected? And along with that, what areas uh, do you think that we are in need of improvement on? And I so know sometimes we ask what seem to be rhetorical questions, repetitive, but nonetheless, we're establishing the record. We're creating discussion here. So, uh, Doctor. Well, it, yeah, it is somewhat rhetorical because NSF is a shining example of investment into uh, basic research, which everyone here on the committee knows of many examples where that has worked so well. But as the committee has already rightfully written into the NSF for the Future Act, it's use-inspired research. You know, I think it really comes to the very heart of a public university, at least, and, and I would say also private universities. We sort of lost our way a little bit and need, need to really ratchet up our game. I, I, I will share with you this APLU. I don't know if you can see this really well, but there's an APLU document that's entitled Public Impact Research. So it's been endorsed by all of APLU. It is essentially use-inspired research. And I really would uh, like to share this with the committee because I think it does a wonderful job why the universities have to rally together. And, and in, in some sense, sets the background for a, a, a solutions director for NSF. I think some of the uh, cautions that I would put out there because I'm very excited, but you've sort of danced around some of them. Uh, some use inspired research and technology driven solutions are quick turnaround. And I applaud that sometimes we need solutions right away. But some use inspired research are, is very similar in time scale with basic research, it could take years 
even though you know where you want to go, it can take years to go there. So I, I'm a little worried about what uh, the NSF director said, speed and scale. I, I like scale, speed maybe for a good fraction, but I'm not sure for everything. Uh, if we have everything at NSF, just quick turnaround, I think that could change the DNA a little bit that I would be concerned about. Uh, the only other caution I would say with universities, because I know I don't have a lot of time, is that we also have to change. Uh, I think some of our P&T, promotion and tenure process, tends to bias it toward basic research. And sometimes, even institutions like ours, we don't give the recognition to, to faculty and students that are doing use-inspired research. And that's on us. I think we need to fundamentally change. And I think they are, slowly. So I hope that helps. Absolutely. And my next question to you, uh, Dr. Also, but uh, Dr. Farouk, if you'd like to comment. Can you both address this issue of long-term sustainable funding? Why is stable funding important in basic research? And what damage can you know, volatile funding patterns do to the research enterprise? Again, making and reinforcing here the fundamental principles we need to remember as we legislate. Yeah, I'll just take a quick stab at this. I mean, I, I'm such a strong proponent of knowing what the funding is going to be for several years. I'd rather know that than have a huge infusion in year one and then have a precipitous drop after that. I think there are examples that you can point at NIH where they tried a doubling and they ramped up quickly and then it fell off a cliff. And that left a lot of our researchers who had ramped up operations sort of grasping as to what the next step was. So anything that's predictable, stable is, is guaranteed to pay off big time. Dr. Root, any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, if we, there's a lot of lessons to be learned by looking at what we did in dealing with Japan, meaning like we also actually studied their innovation system. So we could be strategic in terms of in our uh, uh, not brute force and ignorance. You know, we don't need to copy. It's not a matter of putting more money in, but it's trying to understand what is their advantage. And right now, you know, NSF had the science of science and innovations policy program, which is supposed to study this kind of thing that uh, John Marburger started during his tenure at the White House. Uh, I think we need to actually also equally study uh, because by the 80s, uh, we actually knew what, what was Japan's strength, you know, how they were organizing and what we needed to do to make sure our interests were protected. So I would also encourage the social science research that looks into the innovation systems and innovation policy. So that we can thank you both and thank you to the entire panel. You'll back, Madam Chair. Right. Um, with that, we're going to turn over to Congresswoman Gwen Moore from Wisconsin, another Great Lakes state, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And again, I am so excited uh, about all of our witnesses here today. And of course, it's just like a big, huge classroom uh, where you learn so much. Um, I have a couple of questions that I hope that five minutes will be long enough. I want to talk about where I'm from. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's right on Lake Michigan. And of course, Lake Michigan is my favorite thing that's a constituent of mine, not a human being, is Lake Michigan. And of course, Lake Michigan is the only great lake entirely enclosed within the United States. So I think we have a great stewardship over it. But that being said, the Great Lakes, of course, provide 84% of the of, uh, of the, the fresh surface water in North America and 21% of all the fresh water uh, in the world. It is a very precious resource. And so, uh, Dr. Farouk, I was interested uh, that outside of the nexus between energy and water, uh, what could the National Science Foundation do to help us? Uh, you know, there's this old African proverb that says water has no enemies. You know, you would never know that when you think of all the people who want to pollute it, uh, who uh, don't care for the conservation of it. And, you know, literally, the uh, in, in this region, we formed a water council. Uh, students are at University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, and Whitewater are studying how to get rid of invasive species. And I was wondering if uh, what can NSF do directly to help water-based technologies 
Uh, and then, uh, and then I, I want to follow up with a question, Dr. Blazy, very distressing testimony about STEM, uh, lo, uh, about people of color not having exposure to STEM education. Want, want to know what you think uh, legislative we could do to turn that around. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. And actually, you know, it's uh, important for us to remember that it's, uh, we always talk about the high end, the new shiny objects and, you know, but we shouldn't actually forget about our problems at the community level and the science need for National Science Foundation to not neglect them. So in terms of water, you know, I, I, my specialty is in public engagement and community engagement. And we did a project in, uh, um, under the program called Public Interest Technology. And uh, we looked at uh, trying to team up uh, uh, universities and, and uh, nonprofits to look at uh, their problems uh, to, to engage the community. And in Waco, Texas, the Baylor University uh, uh, looked at uh, engaging their whole community you know, into trying to first frame the problem. Because when we talk about using inspired science, the first important step is to involve the stakeholders who are at the ground and community level. And we not, as I mentioned in my testimony, not start with the, what is the most interesting research questions. Because those problems help us ground our science to reality. And then we, can meet, then, then we can step back and bring the best science that answers that questions. You know, same thing in the question about, you know, lead in our water or the, what happened in Flint, Michigan. We can. We actually need to work with the community in identifying these problems that are not addressed, and then bring in our scientists and our expertise to help address them. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Congresswoman Moore, for the question. Um, should I answer it now, or did you have follow up? Okay. Um, it's a great question, and. Um, We've thought about this for a while, and, and the, the basic strategy or principle that we, we would be most effective is to bring the opportunity where the students are. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, underrepresented uh, minorities are sort of geographically bound. Um, there's financial reasons, there's family obligations, and so they, they, they just can't up and, and go to a different university to pursue these opportunities. So we need to bring the opportunities to them. And that's where this partnership model makes the most sense to me, because you just can't out of whole cloth start new opportunities at institutions that are uh, uh, emerging in their research profiles. So having, I mentioned AI earlier, having a partnership with some university that has the tremendous resources for AI or quantum information systems to partner with these regional or comprehensive universities to be sure that there's some opportunity for the students that are geographically bound. And, and that's why I like the partnership uh, section in the bill. Uh, as Dr. Wakimoto uh, mentioned, it could go farther. Uh, and I think that's sort of a, a debate that the committee should have, subcommittee should have on what the right level of uh, motion forward should be. Thank you so much. And maybe start a little bit earlier finding students rather than when they get in college. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, that was fabulous. And speaking of um, geography, our, our members are mostly in the Eastern Standard Time Zones, Ms. Moore's Central, next members or so are gonna be in the Central Time Zone, but we've got a couple of our witnesses who tuned in from Arizona and California. I've been meaning to recognize your your earlier hour than the, you know, you really were a good morning. It wasn't brutal, but, you know, 8 a.m. for you was, uh, you know, a nice time to start. Um, so with, with that, we're going to go to Mr. Gonzalez, um, also in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, Ohio, just south of me here in Michigan for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens and, and Ranking Member Waltz for holding this timely hearing today uh, to continue our discussion about the importance role that NSF plays in our research economy. As we examine the most productive and effective avenues for not only reauthorizing, but also strengthening NSF, uh, our witnesses have provided some incredibly valuable perspective. And, and so I do want to thank you for that. 
Uh, that's what we need in these hearings. That's why they're productive. Um, so uh, I'll start uh, with Director Thompson. Uh, many of our witnesses discussed the importance of tying NSF research and science in general to addressing societal challenges and trends that are evident in the tech industry today. Could you speak a bit more about the importance of having NSF become more involved in this space? Uh, how important is this focus for industry researchers and how do you see it playing out? Thank you, Congressman Gonzalez for the question. Um, we see NSF's uh, reach and scale as very important and significant. A company in a group like mine at Intel, we are only a few people. We can only reach so far. And of course, most of us are located in the West Coast. So the first place we go is our community colleges, our universities near home, which Intel has many sites, but still the reach of NSF across the country, the bringing together different tier of education institutions, it's something that is really needed. It's something that will bring many others into high tech or into STEM education. And that's why we believe working and collaborating with NSF is very important. Great, and then to open up the same question to our university witnesses, uh, how can the new Directorate for Science and Engineering Solutions position that is proposed by the NSF for the Future Act provide a benefit to university researchers? If we could jump in, whoever wants to take it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess the obvious answer, just by creating this new Directorate, I mean, I know I've been incredibly excited. This creates an opportunity that just wasn't there in the past. So I, I think at the highest level, that's that's how I would answer. I could jump in. Um, I would I would add, sir, that um, you know there there are industries where the line between basic fundamental research and end products is really short. In other words, um, you know the fundamental mission, basic research at NSF. Um, often takes decades to, to evolve into um, uh, usable technology, but there's industries where it happens really fast. And so the ability to have, I think, uh, a director that allows that, to recognize that, to know that there, there is a fine uh, short time between basic research and applied uh, applications is, um, I think is pretty good. And I think it'll help a lot, help the country a lot. Great. Um, and then Dr. Blasey, uh, I was curious if you'd weigh in on this as well, as, as you provided a word of caution in your testimony on this new directorate uh, pivoting NSF from its mission of basic research. Could you maybe sort of take the other side of the coin and, and just get your perspective out a little bit more? Well, well, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Gonzalez. So first of all, um, I think the main way a main way it will help the researcher uh, community is because it's by nature interdisciplinary and many of the problems we're facing that uh, are called wicked problems, kind of term of art in the research community and, and having a directorate that can cross division directorates and, and pull together expertise and resources for these interdisciplinary problems will really make, make a difference. Um, my concern is that if the, um, the stress if is on moving things quickly into the innovation phase, it's already uh, sort of giving the very large research universities uh, uh, a head start because they have really deep and impressive and valuable intellectual property already at their command. And they can just get a uh, start moving faster in innovation. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think we should all be proud that we have that kind of uh, capability at the large universities. There's just a, 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 my caution is that it's something else that will sort of concentrate research opportunity at the few schools. Yeah, I think that's a fair concern and, and um, appreciate your voice in that. And I'll, I'll yield back and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for, for holding this hearing uh, and keeping us on time. Great, yeah, excellent. And I'll just mention, briefly before I introduce our uh, next member for questions. Our ranking member, Mr. Waltz, has to depart at 1230. Rest assured to our witnesses and our fellow questioners, he will be reading through the testimony, okay? So, so just because we don't have him sitting in this beautiful palm tree box that he's in from Florida, you know, but thank you, Mr. Waltz, for your leadership. And with that, just allow me to take a minute to introduce Dr. Foster, who, um, 
is also a chair of the subcommittee on science on, on oversight and is just a, a brilliant and wonderful mind to have on this committee with us. So with that, uh, Dr. Foster, uh, five minutes of questions for you from, from Illinois. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to our witnesses. You know, there, the last line of questioning was uh, talking about how you deal with this transition from basic to applied. You know, there already exists in inside the um, inside the different directorates of the NSF the complete pipeline. You know, all the way through SBIRs and commercialization. And so, as um, at least some of you have been recipients of of uh, grants, not only from the NSF, but if I recall properly, I think Jerry has probably been on the receiving end of uh, everything from DOD to a um, long list of things. And so they, these are handled differently. But do you envisage that if we stand up a new directorate that's focused on applied solutions, that what would happen is that if you have a grant under the, um, under the say, the mathematics and physical science directorate, the, you would then um, then when you, the, you had a bright idea that looks like it was more applied, that then you would transition your grant to this other directorate and have to make friends with a whole new set of grant supervisors in a different directorate. And then when you decided that, okay, there was now a startup business behind this, you would transfer it to a third organization. Um, and is that, is that going to cause grief um, if you have, you sort of stovepipe the different uh development levels instead of incorporating them in each intellectual area. Um, I guess, Jerry, do you wanna take a swing at that? Yeah, Congressman Foster, I, I, I think that um, it won't be as sharp as that. I think, uh, as you know, uh, faculty have multiple inquiries going at sometimes, and sometimes they'll be taking something, to, they'll see an opportunity to take something to market. And that could be an independent funding stream from their basic research. Um, so I, I, think it's, I think it's less um, stark and less well-defined. I think, I think an organizational issue will be how to coordinate that continued support for basic research and that uh, 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 funding to move things in to the innovation innovation ecosystem. And I think that will require careful thought and planning on the part of the NSF. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also mentioned it happens already between different agencies right now. They have to spend a lot of their time, you know, de-conflicting, um, you know, efforts from uh, where you have parallel efforts, uh, some of which are very valuable. Another issue that we're going to have to deal with is the issue of big science. Uh, there are places in science where there's no alternative to have big centralized facilities to be competitive. I mean, you know, Jerry uh, placed his career where it was because he was within in Northern Illinois University, he was within driving distance of a large DOE sponsored national laboratory uh, with unique capabilities that didn't exist anywhere else. Um, uh, similarly, if you talk about say, integrated circuit device development. Uh, you know, you're going to have to provide for many purposes access to a state-of-the-art fab. It is not reasonable for a university with some bright idea to go build their own fab. And so, um, and, and one of the challenges there is that they are actually uh, under the control of, of industry and, and trying to understand how to make it worth industry's time to open up their facilities. You know, I would, I had a, um, a sort of not very encouraging experience uh, a, a little while ago. Argonne Lab recently has, you know, one of the neat things that they did was to deploy uh, Cerebus One, if I remember, which is a, a, a wafer scale AI computer, the first trillion transistor um, uh, computer and uh, just a phenomenal thing. And then I asked the CEO when they had the celebration, oh, who did the, the wafer fab for that wafer scale computer? and it was an offshore uh, company. And it, it sort of broke my heart. And I said, well, what happens when you contacted the American uh, companies and, and they didn't, they weren't interested because of, for whatever reason. I was wondering, you know, um, you know, Ms. Thompson, you know, what are the things that we can do, you know, not only for basic research, but also for, for startups to, to handle this conundrum of how we make it worth your time to um, do something that would not otherwise be worth your time and share your, state-of-the-art resources. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your question, Congressman Foster. And, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. 
Uh, Intel has had a small program called the University Shuttle Program in which we get to manufacture foundry silicon uh, for universities. It's a relatively small program. It's something that we're looking forward to expanding. And, and as you've heard from our CEO, um, the investments in R&D are growing. And so we expect that we will be able to support more of this uh, prototypes that get designed and built by students and professors. Yeah, well, for many years, NSF uh, funded uh, something that was called MOSES, which I was yes. very happy to participate in. And I think a lot of people with uh, in my my amount of baldness remember fondly that. And it's a very effective thing. And it's one of, I think, one of the tragedies and actually maybe even one of the reasons that the chip industry is in trouble right now is that we didn't prioritize that and, and weren't generous enough with making it worth your time. And, and if I may add, this is why we are so interested in ensuring that there is a very clear link between the NSF and the NSTC, because we see this as two pieces, pieces of a very important puzzle. And, and we would be happy to provide more language suggesting how to, to document uh, the engagement between the two. Thank you. I'm over time and yield back. Yeah, well, we'll take you up on that documentation. But uh, with that, let me uh, turn it over to, to my colleague, Dr. Jim Baird, also uh, a research scientist in his own right, representing Indiana and that other university, maybe called Purdue. All right, Dr. Baird, over to you. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, and I appreciate your enthusiasm. And I also appreciate the ranking member Waltz and for conducting this, this hearing here today. And um, and I always I always learn something in these science committees and the and the uh, talents and skills of our witnesses are uh, very um, impressive. But as uh, as Representative Stevens rep mentioned, uh, I'm fortunate to have an outstanding research and STEM focused university like Purdue University in my district, and they work extremely well with NSF. But about 29% of our GDP in Indiana comes from manufacturing and small business manufacturing. And so, uh, so I'm really interested, uh, Ms. Thompson, I think I'll start with you. Could you please discuss what kind of technology training uh, can be conducted through the two-year programs? And please share your thoughts on how the NSF uh, might be able to help support those efforts. That's my first question. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, we at Intel have been partnering with two-year colleges for many, many years. Uh, we recently have announced an engagement with community colleges to create a degree in artificial intelligence. So the first associate degree for community colleges. We have been working with the Maricopa Community College system, and we are uh, hopefully targeting about 20 colleges to be part of this program in which students are able to learn the basics of artificial intelligence and, and get a degree on AI. With um, the possibility of working with NSF, we would be able to scale to much broader reach in more regions of the country, and that's why partnering with NSF is paramount to us. So oh, would any, thank you. Would any of the university uh, witnesses care to respond to that? The relationship with the junior colleges. Yeah, this is, uh, oh. I'm sorry. No, I'll just be brief. This is Barry Butler at Embry Riddle. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, the, um, uh, most all of us do have partnerships of some kind with um, with community colleges. Uh, in our case, we we focus a lot with those that have a uh, discipline specific, you know, that are uh, similar to what we're focused in in aerospace. And that um, the programs are good, and I I think it just addresses that issue that um, you know we do have a lot of people in this country that start their education that way, and and um, you know to to um, to bring them in to other universities, whether it's through partnerships, whether it's through transition programs, is really opening up the sort of the funnel for talent. And I think that's so critical. Uh, how it's done with the different types of programs, it varies from school to school. But I just think 
there's so much talent out there that we just have to address it all and not assume that everybody that's going to be in the STEM workforce of the future starts uh, a four-year program at a, at a name university. That's just not the way it is. Yeah, Congressman Barrett, I'll just chime in. As I stated in our, tes our testimony, about 50% of our students are transfer students from the local community colleges in uh, Illinois. Very important uh, for them to uh, transfer into the university to finish their four-year degree. Um, for again, as I mentioned earlier, they're geographically and financially uh, bound. And um, this is an important uh, opportunity to start uh, broadening the STEM opportunities with those students as well. You know, an observation that I would make in our district, um, uh, <clears throat> sometimes the opportunities you have in those junior colleges uh, or two-year programs, they may not uh, have the funds or the interest to go to a four-year immediately, but the fact that they get into those schools and get a hands-on experience, all of, us, all of a sudden their uh, curiosity uh, stimulates them to want to go further. And when you get a student like that that gets committed, I think it's very uh, insightful and helpful for them to want to go on to advanced degrees and get involved in in STEM per se. If you tell them it's STEM at the beginning, they might not be excited, but you get them in a lab and get them experienced or get them a hands-on experience and suddenly the ball game changes. So uh, I think my time is uh, about up. And so I appreciate um, Congresswoman Stevens, I yield back. Great, no, thank you for that, Dr. Baird. I think that was so spot on and so important for us to think through. And I had to spend a summer at community college. I got the privilege to spend a summer at community college and it was, I connected right in those assets and it was quite transformative right here in Southeastern Michigan. But we've got a really special member of Congress who's, who's up next, um, freshman member, Congresswoman Deb Ross from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much to everybody who's testified today on this crucial, crucial issue. Um, I represent the second district in North Carolina, which is the Research Triangle area, and we are a very STEM-focused area. Uh, as a matter of fact, yesterday I was the special guest for a STEM charter school um, that drew people from several municipalities, several counties, and um, let me tell you, the diversity of the young women at that charter school was something to behold. Um, but I have North Carolina State University in my district, land grant, STEM um, university that gets um, a fair amount of money from the National Science Foundation and is doing really, really well. I was with them and uh, the second gentleman and uh, the Secretary of Transportation last week, seeing all the amazing work that they're doing um, in engineering and other areas. I also represent two HBCUs that used to have medical schools. And they very much want to be able to benefit from research funding and offer more STEM to their students. But both presidents of these HBCUs, Shaw and St. Augs, said that they simply do not have some of the infrastructure and the equipment to do that kind of research. And so I'll direct this first to uh, Dr. Blasey and then anybody else who wants to pipe in. Um, how can NSF help with that, fund just the capacity building? Because the talent and the students and the desire are all there. Yes, uh, thank you for that question, Congresswoman Ross. Well, it gets back to that partnership to build the intellectual capacity. Um, it, it's not enough for students just to visit, and uh, it, it takes time for the faculty to learn the technology and the intellectual aspects of a new topic. So one way is fellowships with the already established universities, and then those individuals, those faculty members, those scientists can take back that uh, expertise back to their school. And these days, the partnership can be virtual. So, but I think really a partnership to, to get the intellectual expertise. Infrastructure is a problem for uh, emerging research in institutions. NSF does have a program, major research instrumentation program and medium scale 
And I think the answer is to increase the funding for those programs, which is in the bill, but to be mindful of how those resources are distributed to broaden research opportunity. Okay. Um, I also have a question um, for Dr. Farouk. Um, also at NC State, which gets um, a fair amount of NSF funding, um, international students make up 35% of their graduate student population. As a matter of fact, my husband got his graduate degree in engineering there, and he said he was one of the only US citizens in his graduate program. Um, and But we need all of these graduate students for the research that we do here. And in your um, testimony, you talked about um, how, in your words, you were a, an early contributor to the leaky pipeline problem in STEM. How can we be more um, inviting of those graduate students? I also serve on the Judiciary Committee and we're dealing with some necessary changes, I hope, to our immigration laws. But uh, Tell me how you think we can keep this talent here in the United States after we've educated these wonderful people. Well, thank you for that question. Um, the STEM problem, that leaky pipeline problem that in my time is actually very different from the STEM problem that we are seeing now. For instance, you know, I have a student who graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in computer science and he worked for intern with Apple, intern with DARPA, and he is now doing touring with uh, bands to do their sound system because <laughs> he just does not find what our big tech is doing as a, it doesn't agree with his moral or ethical position. So a lot of there's a lot of concerns that about uh, big tech that 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 uh, fresh graduates they're feeling, and that's why there is a network of. 31 universities called Public Interest Technology University Network that the New America Foundation started and my institution is a part of. They're trying to address uh, this, this, this gap that you know, our technology is obviously meeting our market needs but not addressing our societal values so, so that you know, we can retain because the nonprofit sector is not big enough for these talents. Now, in terms of uh, uh, retaining uh, uh, students, uh, uh, the competition in abroad is, is very different now because there's a lot of places, a lot of options to go for people. So we need to be actually trying to grow our home talent here at home as much as we can. And to go back to the question about HBCU and, and, and also the previous question about community college, we need to give them an infrastructure to participate you know, when I was at the City University of New York, which also has a, a group of community colleges, uh, we had a two-tiered granting program where the community colleges competed with community colleges. Because what happens is when they come in and big grants as a partner, the large universities dominate and they don't have any opportunity to participate. When I was at Purdue University, I was part of an university transportation centers. We had members of Martin University, for example, in, in Indianapolis. They, they just did not, could not participate in any of the activities on any of the research projects we were doing. So it's, it's kind of bringing also an equity in the system for, for, the, for, for these, uh, uh, also part of our R&D system for them to participate because they're going to become very, very important as we make this transition. As the point made earlier that about two years colleges, as we transition, people are not going to go back and get a four year degree. And this will be the quickest way to do a change in career. So future of work and so forth. So I think uh, NSF can uh, pay attention to that and look at examples that are around. Thank you very much. And I've exceeded my time, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you so much. All right. Um, and with that, we're, we've got two more members for questions. Our next member is um, from uh, Kansas, uh, new member of Congress, freshman, who's also on the Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Innovation Subcommittee. Great, you know, background, I think, from both committees to have on our subcommittee, also political background. So always like it when people who've dedicated themselves to running for office want to be on the Science Committee. So with that, Mr. LaTurner for five minutes of questions. And thank you again, Deb Ross. Mr. Latrona, it's your turn. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member for holding this hearing today. 
I appreciate the testimony of our witnesses on the role that National Science Foundation plays in furthering our research, development, and innovation efforts in this country. And I believe it's an important component in maintaining leadership in the worldwide scientific community. By emphasizing the ideas of a strong STEM workforce and robust public-private partnership, America will continue to be the top scientific leader in the world. This question is for all of you. We've heard a lot about the importance of accountability to public needs as it relates to research and development. Can you explain how each of your institutions or company engage with community partners as you develop your R&D agendas? If I can yeah, somebody start. jump in. Yeah, I, go ahead, I'll, please. I'll go ahead and jump in. Yeah, so I, I'm in the uh, primarily in the aerospace industry, and so our you know our community, uh, so our community, so to speak, is it really is uh, across the whole country. But when we look at sort of locally, um, we look at it from a point of view of engaging um, the uh, both the state as well as the local community in terms of what's what are their key priorities in in our case in terms of economic development. And so um, we're, we're closely attuned with them. Um, we know that bringing uh, aerospace industry around our university, which is what we're doing through our research park uh, quite successfully, I think, helps the community um, in terms of its, uh, its basically its uh, economic status. It's, uh, it elevates the level of earnings in the community and uh, provides additional uh, opportunities for people around it. So we kind of view ourselves in that way uh, with our local community. Yeah, I would add, add that uh, there are two mechanisms we use at UCLA. One is a number of our schools and units have advisory com com committees with uh, community members on there. Uh, another place where we really interact primarily with industry is our tech transfer uh, and development unit where we, we are strongly engaged with industries, whether they're medical, whether they're engineering, et cetera, because they guide us in terms of where we need to focus our efforts. And they help us actually make decisions about what research is the ones that we should actually transition for public use. At Intel, we engage with different community members. Uh, we definitely engage with the top tier universities, uh, the top tier research universities, also with our local universities, our local community colleges, and our local education K through 12 systems. And as you can imagine, um, as employees, we also volunteer a lot of hours uh, last year, close to a million hours were volunteered. And since we're mostly engineers, we're volunteering in programs to advance uh, STEM at all levels of the educational system in the regions where we're located. If yes, I so, may, oh, go, go, go ahead for uh, Mamoun, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was going to say that social embeddedness is part of our university charter at Arizona State University, so we take we find it very uh, uh, strongly, and uh, it is also part of our incentive system. Uh, the, the other thing I would mention about working with the communities, the National Science Foundation has created a network of uh, science museums called the uh, National STEM Education Networks. That's over 400 museums all over the country. And those community, they are, they are community organizations that can work to bring citizens and, and non-traditional participants into the same uh, process. So I think that's a tremendous resources that the National Science Foundation has created that can be used to engage not only uh, the public, but also community organizations. And we had a funded project from NOAA where we work on climate change resilience where we work with science museums in 20 different cities and they work with uh, the, the local uh, planners and the resilience planners and their plans. So there is a way, there's already a network and uh, we should leverage it. Thank you. So at NIU, uh, engaging with the local community is very much in our DNA. Uh, as Dr. Wakimoto mentioned, we have advisory boards in our, all seven colleges. Um, we actually focus on it quite extensively. We have a division uh, for outreach, engagement, and regional development, and we uh, uh, consult, work with, uh, assist the communities across the state and in northern Illinois with that division. 
I appreciate it very much. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, my time is running out. I yield back. Great. Thank you. And, and with that, we're going to turn to our last member of Congress for questions. Um, very significant to have Mr. Don Beyer on this committee. His home base is the NSF. He's very dedicated to this agency, and uh, we look forward to hearing his questions. With that, Mr. Beyer. Madam Chair, thank you very much. You know, I have a, a particular parochial interest because the National Science Foundation is about five blocks from my house. Uh, and I've been good friends with the last two directors. And it's been great to have these two hours of affirmation of the National Science Foundation in our, in our life. But anticipating a debate that's coming up, let me push back in a couple of ways. First for Dr. Cruz Thompson. I was on the call with our chair lady um, sometime earlier with the president of a major university who uh, pointed out that there was no equivalent to the Bell Labs in our country today, uh, no huge university or uh, business um, investing money in um, use design, application design stuff, uh, and that the National Science Foundation was essentially failing in its, in its lack of emphasis on things that were to be used. For example, he said that the National Science Foundation today would never have funded the development of chips or integrated circuits or things like that because that wasn't basic research. Rather, it was a company trying to find some way to, to replace vacuum tubes. Um, especially now with the uh, this National Science Foundation for the Future, how do you respond to that criticism? Does the National Science Foundation, do they or can they play a meaningful role in actual use-based rather than curiosity-based investments? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. I can tell you from my experience, I've been working close with, uh, in partnership with NSF for the last three years, especially with the size directorate. And I can attest for a very important uh, prioritization of collaborating in use-inspired science and in use-inspired applications of, of research. I think the example of the convergence accelerator is one. The example of last week's announcement of uh, three uh, U.S. agencies plus nine companies working together to advance resilient and intelligent next G, basically the fundamentals of the 6G programs, um, show you that, that the NSF is, is poised to do it. Perhaps what it needs is more funding. So that, that's a great pivot. And so Dr. Wakamoto, the... Fiscal year 2021, NSF budget is about $8 billion. Under this new For the Futures Act, it will double in four years to, to $16 billion. Is that too much money too quickly? Will you have good money chasing bad projects? Uh, I actually don't think it's too much too quickly uh, because a large fraction of that money goes into the new directorate. If you actually look at the RNRA uh, budget minus the new directorate, uh, it's six percent increase over that uh, over that time frame, which is you know a healthy increase, but it's not like a, an enormous infusion into the other basic science directorates. So, Dr. Blasey, thank you, um, Dr. Walker. Dr. Blasey, the Endless Frontier Act, which is sort of uh, I think fair to say the alternative to this NSF for the future, talks about Congress deciding on ten key emerging technologies for their new director for technology and innovation. Should Congress be deciding what the emerging technologies are or will be for a 10 year period of time? Well, first of all, I'll say that most of those technologies they have listed are appropriate, um, but I do think that the NSF should be allowed to decide how to, which to pursue and at, at what level. And let me ask the same question about money too, Dr. Blasey, because Endless Frontier Act has a hundred billion over five years in this new director for technology and innovation. Is that too much money too fast? I think uh, it, it's difficult to spend that much money that fast. And I think a, a ramp up, it would be more appropriate. Um, I, and also, I think one has to be very careful, as we said earlier before, we have to do no harm to the basic mission. And so I think that has to be balanced with the growth and the ramp up of the money. Very cool. Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Farouk, one, one last question. 
the Endless Frontier Act also talks about test beds. And I find that many of my peers are excited about getting money out of uh, Cambridge and Berkeley and you know, the handful of places where it goes. Um, is there something NSF could also be doing independently of Endless Frontiers? Well, my personal view is that other agencies are better positioned to do that than the National Science Foundation because it will be asking for too much of a transition that is not in its core mission. So, and for that kind of money, it might not be used as well as could it can. Uh, the other thing concerned about that kind of level of investment is the absorptive capacity. I don't think we have that kind of a workforce to absorb that kind of money so quickly. Madam Chair, thank you, and I yield back. Great, thank you. Um, before we bring this hearing to a close, uh, we're just going to thank our witnesses again um, for, for participating in today's hearing. The record is going to remain open for, for two weeks for additional statements and questions um, that committee members may, may ask of, of our witnesses. And just as a reminder, today's hearing was called the National Science Foundation Advanced Research for the Future of U.S. Innovation Part Two, Part Two. So we, we're we're in a series. You know, it's it's kind of like you know these sci-fi films where they're so massive and it's such a complex thing. And we did one last week. Now we had Part Two, and we're going to continue to dive in. But rest assured, as uh, Mr. Byer just so nicely positioned us, we will be coming back to the record for for your what you've given us today. This is gonna be a part of how we move forward. And the, the great thing about our government and these branches of government is, you know, we have got a process for passing and shaping the nation's laws. A lot of times that process frustrates people because we don't get things done. But right now on this committee, we have a track record record of getting done and doing and delivering. And frankly, this is where you achieve unity. You know, I think I said bipartisan at the beginning of this hearing, but if you listen to what we are asking and talking and engaging with all of you on, you know, the U.S. scientific research enterprise, American innovation, competitiveness, engaging in our communities and leaving no one behind, those are the things that bring everyone together. That's how we stay as positioned and united and committed to delivering a real solution and an agenda for it. Now we aren't the appropriators on this committee, you know, but we are going to be making a very serious recommendation through our authorizing to the appropriators about what we want to do. And we know we have a president, finally, you know, a president who wants to, you know, spend a little bit, you know, but and that's no offense, but he's really committed to the investing here because the ROI is also there. So, you know, it's a beautiful country and it's, it's so many, uh, great comments and, and questions here. And so I imagine I'd be expecting some things for the record here. I'll, I'll just keep our witnesses on alert. But the two hours you've given us this morning and into the afternoon, for those of us in the in the time zones that slipped into the afternoon, are, are greatly appreciated. And, and with that, we're, we're going to excuse the witnesses. The hearing will now be adjourned. Thank you.